just have a uh, panel discussion, so we're not going to show a bunch of slides. Yay. <laughs> and, and so I'd like to step my, my two colleagues to introduce themselves. Uh, Mike? Yeah, sure. My name is Mike Bell. I'm Senior Vice President and General Manager for Corning. Um, and uh, I've been with Corning for 23 years. And uh, part of our business is wireless, of course. Uh, we uh, distribute antenna systems, as well as all kinds of other optical All right, my name is Jim Parker. I'm a senior manager with AT&T's Antenna Solutions Group. Uh, AT&T formed the Antenna Solutions Group right at about four years ago. Uh, we, we focus primarily in uh, in-building wireless for large public venues. The technologies that we deploy are neutral stats, small cells, and white hat. Thanks, Jim. So what we, uh, we thought we'd do uh, is just a couple things here. Uh, number one, uh, you know, this over the years, recent years, there's been uh, you know, a number of campus incidents and, and other things that have raised questions with regards to uh, wireless coverage inside of dorms, uh, classrooms, and other buildings. Uh, what we thought we'd do in this session today is talk about four main subjects. One, uh, what is the applicability of wireless technologies in different types of buildings within the campus? Second, costs and business models. Third, stakeholders and procurement requirements. And fourth, deployment considerations. And the format we're going to use today is I'm going to just throw out a couple of questions uh, to my colleagues and then I'll pick up a couple of questions and we'll try to get each one of these and we'll leave time at the end, a good 15, 20 minutes for uh, Q&A with the audience as well. So we'd love to have a conversation with you. So we see this just as sort of a conversation uh, and then we'll ask y'all to join, join in. So with that said, uh, I'll start and we'll throw the first one out to, uh, to Jim. And Jim, just what is a distributed antenna system and how is it used in today's campuses? And how do small cells differ? Well, a, a distributed antenna system will, will take an RF source and, 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 as the name implies, using a lot of antennas and a lot of, a lot of cable will distribute that signal throughout the, the property. Um, how it differs from a small cell solution a small cell solution typically uses a, a standard stand, uh, I mean a standalone box, which provides the RF resources. So, so when you kind of compare and contrast the, the, the advantages and disadvantages of a neutral host DAS system vis-a-vis -vis of a small cell, the, the advantage of a neutral host DAS system is it can be neutral hosted, in that we or the venue owner could deploy the, the distributed antenna system, and then the multiple wireless operators or carriers can join that system and leverage the shared uh, wire uh, resources that the DAS provides. The other advantage of a distributed antenna system is it, it can handle a lot of capacity. So we can we can support multiple technologies, you know, like a, a GSM, UMTS, CDMA 2000. Uh, LTE and even LTE advanced, so we can support multiple technologies, uh, multiple frequencies. Whereas when you're looking at small cells, at this point in time, there is not a neutral host small cell. So if you wanted to have all four tier one carriers have small cells support this room, we'd have to have four small cells in that corner, and the next room would have to have four small cells, each small cell for each wireless carrier. It's, it's, it's really not an optimal condition. So really, from my perspective, where we, where we differentiate where a neutral stays and a small cell fits into play, where um, small cells are primarily a coverage-only solution, where you just need to, to light up a small area, um, they're, they're really not set up for the, for the capacity. And, and, and they're also um, best used only in situations where we just don't need um, and the solution. So, kind of compare and contrast. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> so, Mike, you know, uh, Jim talked about cellular technology in the campus. Well, Wi Fi is very common across the dorms and in classrooms and other buildings. Can Wi Fi be combined with DAS uh, or small cells? Um, the answer to that, of course, is for sure it can. Um, what we think about when we combine those is uh, a medium, though, that can handle the capacity needed for more than one um, service or solution. 
And so um, typically, uh, we could either set up the infrastructure such that it shares, you know, multiple technologies share infrastructure. Um, and even in that shared situation, we can have dedicated lanes, basically, or fibers, or other media for those particular solutions all within the same network. Now, when I'm thinking about the requirements for that network to support multiple technologies like that, small cells, and Wi-Fi, I want to make sure that it, first of all, has a high capacity. Um, because there's lots of different things that you might want to do with that, repurpose that, as it were, later, as you grow and your business grows, and uh, I'm sorry, as your campus grows, and the needs of your, uh, all your different constituents grow because of the technology changes, as well as just the different usages that students or faculty or others that visit the campus might have for their smart devices or other things that they would use in the future. Um, you know, think about remote powering of devices. Um, in fact, uh, all these antennas have to get power from somewhere, um, so the network has to build up sufficient capacity for future needs, as well as remote powering to make sure all the devices work. And the, the media that are used, and we of course sell it for corners, so we, we think fiber is optimal for this um, because it has nearly unlimited bandwidth. Um, you, you really want a media too that you can put in for your infrastructure needs that supports Ethernet, cellular, um, as well as public safety and a whole host of other applications for the future. So the answer is yes, it can. I mean, we can create an infrastructure that supports multiple technologies, kind of leverage the IT dollars as far as they can. Super, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so the next question actually comes to me, and I'll ask it of myself. So with a variety of solutions, how does an institution leverage these solutions in dorms and classrooms, and are there any restrictions associated with the solution? So, you know, um, Black Box Network Services, we come at this, uh, we're not a manufacturer, uh, we're not a carrier, uh, we are a systems integrator. Right? So our role in the world is to help institutions uh, leverage these various technologies. So uh, we have uh, sort of a in view of what's going on. <clears throat> and our perspective, uh, in having done this now for the last 15 years with institutions, uh, we work in both the cellular world and in the wire world. <clears throat> and one of the things that we look at in this environment is that you have a lot of choices. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there's outdoor data, outdoor map, there's outdoor data, there's indoor data, there's Wi-Fi. But one of the things that we suggest is that an institution look at it from the user population, the user base. And we think there's really three uses of, of wireless inside of an institution. There's consumer use, that's us walking around using it as a guest, what have you. There's the enterprise use of wireless, that's where wireless is used by the enterprise for the running of the enterprise, the campus, etc. And the third is those things that become mission and or life critical. And so if you're making in your uh, healthcare institutions, you're using wireless to actually deliver patient care, what have you. And so the choice of technology should be governed by the user or the use case for those technologies and to pick the technologies that will work. And it's going to be a combination of Wi-Fi, wireless LAN, and cellular-based technologies. Uh, and as the uh, suppliers, as the carriers uh, and device manufacturers with new application and capabilities, you have the choice of picking the best network to serve the needs of the campus. Uh, and so we think that's the, the proper way to go. We don't really see restrictions in any sense uh, other than the fact that pick the right technology that works for the given, uh, the given building, the given venue, and the given use case on campus. So that's kind of how our, our perspective on that. Uh, before moving on to the second session, are there any, there any comments on this section from the general right? If not, I'll, I'll move to the next step. Uh, well, well, <coughs> um, in terms of Jim's answer, I'm just really intense. This is one other advantage I was thinking about as you were answering, too, is just the direction of capacity. So if a big base station has lots of capacity, and if the DAS is designed uh, to be able to do this, can actually steer that capacity to different parts of the campus, kind of follow the student during the day, or you may have a lot of capacity for certain places where a lot of people gather, and you don't need that on those places that are vacant. Um, the use of a uh, different types of DAS technologies can actually redirect that capacity to different places where people actually are when they're not in the DAS about that. It's interesting too. Small cells are kind of stuck wherever they are. Yeah, very good point. <clears throat> All right, so let's move on to the uh, costs and business models uh, section. Uh, and Jim, I'm going to come back to you again. Uh, in higher education and DAS, certainly in stadiums and arenas, the most common funding models are carrier-led or funded uh, 
and third party led or funded models. What are some of the key considerations with respect to ownership and long term obligations? Well, I tell you, these SAS systems are really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, if if, if if they weren't expensive, we wouldn't even be having these these conversations. Um, there's 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 several business models in use. Um, one one of course is the, the venue would 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 own the infrastructure. Um, the, the other model would be the carrier would own you know, the infrastructure, and it would either be uh, a system designed for a single carrier solution or it would be a neutral host solution. And, and, and the other option is a third party neutral host, where a third party would, would take overall responsibility for the solution. So, so when you're looking at a distributed antenna system, there's a, there's a couple of components. One, the wireless operators have spent an inordinate amount of money giving money to our federal government to have rights to transmit in that frequency. So as such, the wireless operator will own uh, the, the RF source, and this is, we typically deploy uh, dedicated base stations for our uh, distributed antenna systems. So we'll own the RF source, uh, we'll also own the backhaul, because we want to make sure that we have enough um, backhaul traffic to, to handle uh, the, the load and demand of, of this network. So really what we're talking about that, that's up for discussion regarding the business models is actually the dads infrastructure, which includes the head end, the remote units, the antennas, and all the cabling associated with it. So, so the owner of the system would then take ownership and responsibility for the actual you know, capex, you know, the, the, the purpose of the system. It would, it, they, would, they would be responsible for uh, coordinating with, with the various carriers um, that they would like to have installed on the network. And then, of course, they're responsible for the ongoing um, maintenance of that system. You know, unfortunately, you know things go out and you know, things go bump in the middle of the night, and things need to be need to be replaced and repaired. So, so those those are the various models. Um, I, I talked about the, the single carrier model versus a neutral host carrier model. Um, in the early days, the, the, the wireless carriers tended to only deploy a single carrier solution. But, but with the realization of today that most users would prefer to have one set of infrastructure support all the wireless carriers, um, a single carrier model is it's not being used as much as it used to be. Um, it used to be all the systems that our organization deploys are our neutral host as a result. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> Excuse me. Thanks, Jim. All right, so the next question comes back my way. Um, how does the enterprise business model work, and what benefit does an institution receive when deploying a mutual solution with or without Wi-Fi, and will carriers connect? So again, coming at it from the enterprise perspective, you know, <clears throat> this, this whole question in the, the uh, higher end market is, you know, whose responsibility is it uh, to make wireless work uh, inside the, across the campus? Um, and as, as Jim pointed out, you know, there's a funding model that makes sense for a stadium or an arena <clears throat> because at the end of the day, uh, he who writes the check is to dictate the technology and the system and what have you. And many campuses have experienced situation where, uh, fine, I get the big venues done, uh, the stadiums, the arenas, there's even a revenue share model that's going back to the university and under that. But I sit there for years with other buildings that have no coverage, and maybe it's a little bit of outdoor guys and coverage, but I have the other needs and they don't get done. And so there's a question of, of who owns the responsibility for that. One of the things that, that we suggest uh, is that in the other vertical markets, the enterprise takes ownership of the airwaves inside the building. And ownership means funding models, so that means funding the DAS, funding the Wi-Fi going in. <clears throat> and if you deem wireless to be critical to the mission, uh, can you think of any other mission-critical infrastructure that the university doesn't have control over? Uh, so you know, when it's critical to the mission, you tend to have control over it. So the enterprise model, i.e. when the enterprise and the university is funding, what you get is control. Uh, you control then the timing, you control where it goes, you control when it goes in, and now you write in the check for it as well. What the only key requirement there is, if you're going to do that, and we advocate that it's a good thing to do, 
then it still needs to be built to the requirements that the commercial operators uh, require. Because again, as Jim pointed out, they pay those billions of dollars for those frequency licenses. It is their network. If there's poor quality, they get the black eye that they don't, they don't want to have. So the integrator still needs to build that gas to meet the carry requirements. But it's a funding model where the enterprise maintains control over timing, location, when it happens. And as long as that DAS is built to the proper specifications, and integrators like us know what those are, and we work directly with the carriers to ensure that it's built to those specifications, then the carriers will in fact come and connect to that, to that system. Uh, and that, that's the model that we're looking at. So uh, with that, um, the last question in this section, Mike, is for you. So given that higher ed is using more and more funding models across the campus, and we're talking about going to classrooms, do you see these models changing? And could in building solutions for higher ed be leveraged for multiple uses? Yeah, so the answer to that, it's, it's kind of a leading question. Is, yes, we believe that uh, the investment that's made that had traditionally been um, separated just for DAS can be made in infrastructure that can be used not only for DAS, but for lots of other applications that run on. Of course, have to invest in infrastructure that has the bandwidth and then the power out to the, all the different points that you want to be able to access and network for these small purposes. But if done properly and wisely, just like uh, in the macro network where corning is really big and, and selling fiber to home and networks all over the country do multiple things, companies like AT&T, um, there's all kinds of applications that could ride over the same infrastructure built. And to uh, build a point, if you own the infrastructure, then you can use this infrastructure for multiple purposes. Now there have to be dedicated fibers or other media for particular things in some cases. But in a lot of cases, they can be shared for multiple um, applications that can run. Of course, you got cellular and Wi-Fi that we're talking about now, but also just your um, Ethernet in general, um, security cameras, um, building systems, automation, uh, digital signage, and you can also think about more advanced solutions like location-based services and things like that. And of course, if we have intelligence all the way to the edge of all, you can put all different kinds of sensors and you can imagine what different applications uh, might run on people's smart devices in the future. But this uh, network then serves as kind of a, a linkage back to. Great. Jimmy, what's the comments in this section of the law? Well, I mean, actually, the um, when, when you're looking at the cost of a distributed antenna system, like a third of the cost is actually in, in, in rolling the system out and pulling the fiber and the cable. And, you know, and, and to your point, fiber can, can handle so much capacity. Um, why not just pull another strand or two while you're pulling it, right? So, I mean, you know, fiber is less expensive than copper. You don't have to worry about people digging, <laughs> digging it out and stealing it from you. Uh, because silicon, you know, glass is, yeah, you can't use it for anything else. And um, it, it gives you, you have then a future-proof solution that you can use for other, other applications. Because you know, for instance, from our perspective, you know, we're rolling out LTE, uh, which, which will support um, you know, next generation services. The next version supporting LTE advanced with with enough bandwidth, you can actually get it gig download speeds over the commercial airwaves. Well, you really need the ability to have to, to be able to carry all of that traffic to the remote units as well as to backhaul that traffic. And, and, and that's the advantage of fiber optic, that's the advantage of the distributed antenna system. Because largely what you're doing is, is, is you're buying a system that's, or, or installing a system that's, that's largely future proof. You know, if, if as new technology comes up, all you need to do is add additional resources at the head end. If you wanted to add public safety, add an additional resource supporting public safety at the head end, um, making it a lot easier so you could share and utilize that, that shared wireless infrastructure for, for a number of services. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> so um, let's move on to the uh, third subject. And this is kind of a little more of a drill down into the uh, stakeholders and the procurement requirements. So, um, and the first question is, is coming my way. Who are the key stakeholders in an inbuilt model solution? Carriers, systems integrators, or the institution? And, and the answer is yes, in all of them. Uh, so in, you know, in, this, in this business, um, there are multiple stakeholders. 
uh, as we said earlier, uh, certainly the, the carriers are a stakeholder. It's their network, it's their frequencies, it's their services, their business, commercial business operation. Uh, the, the university institution is certainly a stakeholder, uh, but the systems integrator is also a stakeholder. In it. Uh, and again, as I said earlier, the systems integrator uh, is the one that you have to rely on to do it right, uh, to do what is right, so that the others will connect to understand the technology, understand the options uh, as you start to integrate these technologies. You know, we started doing uh, in building DAS systems uh, 12, 13 years ago. Um, you know, just a bunch of cables and antennas, how hard can it be? Uh, it wasn't that hard. Um, it is pretty hard today. You know, things have changed rapidly uh, just in the last few years, and that's why you see the advent of new technology coming from companies like Corning. You see new requirements coming from companies like AT&T. So it's a very complex uh, employment process. Uh, and uh, so th there is important stakeholders. <clears throat> but I would suggest that even within the enterprise, within the university, there are multiple stakeholders inside the university that should come to the table. So we're a big believer in having a wireless policy. And so you may have security, facilities, engineering. There are many users of wireless in different types of wireless uh, inside the campus. So uh, and a lot of the conversation tends to be around getting the cell phones to work, which is important. But uh, as Mike pointed out, there are many other wireless services that can also benefit from the deployment of an integrated wireless infrastructure to enhance all services on the campus. Uh, for example, we also do a lot of hospitals, we've got a lot of university hospitals, and there we can get into actual patient care. So wireless can be used for patient care, monitoring devices, things on those lines. So there are multiple stakeholders, and our encouragement is to bring those stakeholders to the table to talk about what's going on in the campus, what your plans are, what the goals are, and, and look at them all as, as one bucket, if you will, and then figure out the business model behind that to go forward with that. So with that, um, I'll go to the, the second question uh, again for, uh, for you, Jim. Uh, with these stakeholders, who is setting the standards uh, for in-building requirement, and are they different for a stadium, an arena, versus a dorm or other building? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem with sharing the mic. You have to be careful who, who has the mic. <clears throat> so the, um, well, let's we'll, we'll see. Um, the, the, the wireless operator owns the spectrum. Um, we, if your phone works, the first person you call and complain to is the wireless operator, right? So, and we, we, we have a vested interest in ensuring that these systems uh, operate and coexist within, within our network. So we, we, we need to ensure that the, the system will provide you know, added capacity and coverage for, for the venue, but also ensure that it doesn't interfere with, with the rest of our network. Um, so, so, so that's you know, extremely important. Um, when, when you're looking at stadiums versus dorm rooms, and we're talking about you know, one of the advantages of dev systems, you can kind of shift you know, the, the coverage and capacity but with these uh, DAS systems, you can build systems that are extremely dense. So we, um, at at and Park in San Francisco, um, they're, they're so, they're, they, they so love their little gizmos and toys over in Silicon Valley. They all, I mean, yeah, you, you go to a conference in Silicon Valley and say, you know, how many people have four devices and five devices and somebody in the back row has got six, right? So, and, and they're bringing all these things to their ball games. So we actually have um, antennas every third seat, every, every third row, um, in order to provide the, the capacity uh, for, for the fans at, at that venue. Um, now, now when you're looking at dorm rooms, um, you know, having two kids, which, which have, have gone through, and, and well, one graduated, <laughs> the other one's still working progress, but, <laughs> but, but, but they, they, they spend, they too spend an inordinate amount of time, you know, using, using technology and, and these devices. So we're, we're not, we're not deploying them quite as dense as you would in a stadium environment, um, but, but in dormants, um, we, we are. Um, also, when you're looking at universities, Let's let's not forget, you know, let's not forget the macro. Um, there, there's there's a there's a lot to be said for having tower assets pointed on campus and being able to cover the, the overall area, and then utilize you know distributed antennas, small cells, and, 
in the first Wi-Fi for um, those areas where you have trouble. So you know that you will You can't handle, you, you can't provide enough capacity at a stadium with a macro base station. You just can't do it. So that's where we need the distributed antenna system. Um, if, if we had the, the macro using the, the outside in approach, we may be able to cover a lot of buildings and then use uh, outdoor DAS systems or indoor DAS systems or as needed. And that's, and that's the advantage of using fiber. You know, frankly, we, we, could, we could install a DAS head end and then fiber out to the various buildings that require the additional services and features of, of, a, of a DAS system and, and provide those services. So we have a lot of flexibility. <clears throat> Thanks, Jim. So, Mike, over to you. So, how do these requirements play in purchasing a system, for example, RFP, etc.? And, and I think maybe you can expand a little more on what Jim was just talking about. If a DAS is deployed on campus, can signal sources be used in smaller buildings? Maybe talk a little about the distribution <coughs> side of that. Right. So, um, first of all, on the, on the part of the hanging part, uh, we were just talking about this a little bit earlier with a couple of colleagues that it actually parlays very well, especially in line with what Jim was just saying. You think about having this high capacity infrastructure that I'm on that is used for a lot of different things instead of an individual infrastructure for every single subsystem that uh, is housed on campus. That can, um, as you imagine, as you can imagine, that can really expand uh, an IT budget in terms of what you can accomplish with that same spend. And so, um, with, with a fiber backbone. Saying too, that allows a lot of different applications all to be housed on that same infrastructure. Now, with respect to the DAS being used to, to drive different, one signal source to drive lots of different things, there are all different kinds of transport systems there. So, a couple of things that are important. One is you have to have a DAS that can actually do capacity steering. Okay, so um, there's lots of DASs that just sit there and somebody has to go in and plug in different cables on everyone and configure it in different ways. So, you've got to pick a DAS solution. And a, uh, a good integrator can help you with that kind of a choice that actually can real time steer. Um, there are DASs, and we make one of them, of course, um, that, that you can set up that will follow, and the signal source can actually move to different locations, can be transported basically to different locations, different times of day, different days of the week, and the like. Um, and so, so, because you do have this virtually unlimited bandwidth pipe going from building to building, you can take an RF source that happens to be in a stadium or in a healthcare facility or in a library uh, for that matter and use that to um, cover multiple buildings that are smaller in nature that may just need a little bit of capacity. So you just have one big capacity source, maybe a small antenna that doesn't use a whole lot of capacity and a smaller um, classroom building that's only used you know, six or eight hours a day, for example. So yeah, it, it actually works very well in terms of Take signal sources, the expensive assets of companies like at and um, that provide the, the ability to use the, the spectrum that, that they're licensed to use, and all the users can enjoy the use of those devices in all different places on campus. And one of the other things that, that um, Jim also said was uh, covering the outside environment. And so you got the macro environment, and um, you're going to deploy towers and the like and aim them at the campus. There's going to be shadow points and things on and that's where things like these same sources can actually be used for indoors, but also to light up different sections of campus outdoors that might be adjacent to a building. Um, so you may have a quad between dorms or something like that. If we're down there on the weekends uh, playing volleyball and moving around, my, my kids uh, went to chapel and they just graduated from Virginia Tech, so I understand what those campuses look like. So you got lots of people wanting to interact and network and study. You know, we do believe that about two thirds of the, the use of devices on campus is for educational purposes, believe it or not, because I think educational purposes a lot of times take maybe a uh, more bandwidth and certainly more time in terms of uh, going and getting information that's needed to, to do the coursework. But uh, yeah, the, the system can be used, or the, or the infrastructure can be used to pull up the outside areas to um, give it a small setup for um, an extension of that. Okay. <coughs> So just to, uh, to add a little bit on the, the procurement model, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so uh, we see a lot of RFPs, and they all come across my desk. They flow through a number of people on our company, they come across my desk. 
And the typical RFP that we see from the university says something like this. It says, I'd like an operator to build a DAS on my campus to cover all of the buildings. Uh, I don't want to pay anything. I want a third party funding model to support this. And I want all the buildings done, and I'd like it to be done in 18 months. Has anybody done an RFP like that? <laughs> Very common, right? And so um, we look at those RFPs, and we don't respond to them. Um, and sometimes the third party operators will respond, perhaps carriers will respond to those. Um, but many of these RFPs that we see uh, have a fundamental lack of understanding of the business model, right? And so the thing that I'll offer in this session is that <clears throat> the fundamental starting point of the business model is that if the university is not going to fund the DAS and is for third party funding, whether it's directly with the carriers or through a third party tower company, only the amount of DAS will get built out that AT&T and their counterparts are willing to pay for. Uh, and it is a business, it is their business model that is driving the business model, not yours. Because the third party operator, and we have done some third party uh, deployments as well, the third party operator will only build as much DAS as they can extract monies from AT&T, Verizon, and the other commercial operators. And so the fundamental thinking in the university perhaps needs to change to say, okay, let me identify what can be funded by others based on their commercial business operations and what needs to be funded by the university and match that against where you think the need is in the university. Um, and toward that end, one of the suggestions that was made uh, at the DASH Congress last year you know, is, do you have the resources on staff to understand all the subtleties and nuances of all of this? And, and perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. Um, one of the things that might be another path to go is do an RFP to select a systems integrator, to select an expert in the field uh, that is a, a neutral uh, party, if you will. Now, we're not neutral. Our, our job is selling and building and deploying DAS systems, right? Uh, there are companies like us that have a lot of expertise that we can lend to you. So you might think about selecting an integrator that can help you uh, with understanding the requirements, what might get funded, what might not get funded, etc. The good news is, uh, Jim and his counterparts, they'll talk to us. They, they tell us what they're interested in. They, they, they know where they want to go. They've got a two-year, three-year, five-year plan for build-outs and what have you. Uh, and they're willing to share that information. So uh, perhaps thinking about what's critical and what can get funded uh, before throwing out an RFP uh, might make that RFP process more more functional for you and, and deliver the results you're looking to deliver. So I'll offer that as a, a comment on the procurement process. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll move on to the uh, to the next section, which uh, we call it deployment considerations. So Mike, to you, uh, can you describe the steps in a typical in-building installation, design installation, commissioning, optimization? we we'll spend a few minutes on that. Sure. So um, uh, first of all, it's not, it, it is complex, but it's very similar to what you for a wireless LAN network. Okay. More complicated than that, but it, it, it's similar. Um, the difference is primarily that it's it's, on, it's less in spectrum, right? So um, a carrier has to bring an RF source to be able to use that spectrum in the building. And it's wise to pick a system integrator that's familiar with the business models, how funding does and doesn't work, um, has worked with carriers and what their design criteria are to make sure that you get sufficient capacity and coverage inside of whatever building or event or part of the campus that you're actually trying to design for. So it's not wise to just kind of go alone and white knuckle it for uh, one of these types of uh, solutions. Um, we, we at Corning have designed a, a new platform that uh, is available, the little one wireless platform, specifically for environments like um, a higher education campus. And it's, it starts with the design. So there's lots of third party uh, capable software out there that we can employ, or a system integrator, or AT&T, uh, a carrier employs to, to design what's needed specifically, and it has to be custom designed for the application. Um, what we believe is uh, fiber actually works and uh, conveys the signal, so the signal over much longer distances without any attenuation or very little attenuation as opposed to things like coax. And so we believe it's advantage to design with, uh, with fiber for that particular reason from a design consideration, not just all the PRF considerations, but also the infrastructure that's going to carry all those signals from point A to point B. 
from an installation perspective, um, our solution is actually plug and play. Um, so everything arrive, would arrive on site as needed, and the installation is going to be probably about half as uh, timely. Um, it will take half as long, roughly, because um, if you've ever seen a DAS installation, a typical DAS installation takes half inch coax, which are kind of fairly thick. Uh, they, they look like basically flexible conduit whenever you bend it, and there are a lot of considerations in terms of how tightly you can or can't bend it. And it limits really where you can run uh, the different uh, media to get from the head end out to the different antennas. Um, with, the, with the fiber type of the solution, it's a lot more flexible. You're dealing sometimes with 200 year old buildings that, that didn't have, uh, they weren't made for you know, this big, uh, thick, hard to, to bend or hard, how hard to route a uh, conduit to work uh, seamlessly within. And to uh, Jim's point earlier, as the technology advances in some of these buildings, you just want to put it in one time. Because as soon as you go to something like mine, you're going to need multiple collections versus a single fiber cable. So that's the reason why we think fiber is an optimal choice for the installation piece. And you have these really dense places like dorm rooms, classrooms, and the like, that maybe older buildings or just don't have, weren't built with that kind of uh, technology in mind, maybe when they were built many years ago. From a commissioning perspective, um, that systems can be uh, timely and sometimes difficult to tune and get up and running properly because with all the different considerations for coverage, there's lots of um, considerations based on building material, size, shape, all different sorts of things. The macro environment can't be too loud, can't be too soft. Um, there's a lot of tuning that actually has to be done and a lot of configuration of different connections to make sure that you can connect, you have enough RF source for, uh, to, to cover it enough power to cover that area from the antenna. Our solution was actually built with that in mind. It actually has a sort of a wizard function, a self-tuning function, it has a listening function. And since you're running technology the whole way to the edge of the network, it can hear the macro environment, and it can hear what it's doing in the inside of the environment. We have these self-tuning features that you can use and continue, and it actually adjusts the gains and other things within the system to optimize that without having to go and tweak a bunch of knobs and switches and so that's, that's the commissioning process. And usually the commissioning of the DAS is one of the kind of uh, nail-biting events. Uh, sometimes you put it in the end, you get a lot of attention to make sure it actually does exactly what you wanted it to do at the end. And then from an optimization perspective, we talked about this earlier, um, the capacity steering, I believe, is really a key feature, especially on campuses. Um, and, and the reason is, is the, the students and the faculty are the ones using this, you know, this capacity. If you just have the capacity installed in one place for one purpose for one building, and that building is empty um, during a large portion of the day, but it's really full at other times, then it's just not very effective use of these kind of resources. And so if, if you build a solution that has that capacity steering function in mind, then when you're at the ball game, great, you have what you need, but on the other um, six days of the week, and uh, 400 or 40 other weekends when you're not actually there, you can actually use that base station to make it for other things, like the dorm rooms or the lab or the classrooms or the like. You can imagine is that kind of what's happening in the macro environment. There's a lot of steering going on. That's what that's what to kind of what you probably heard during the sea ran. People are talking about how they steer the capacity around during the work day. People aren't home and working. Same thing happens on a campus in a campus environment. When people are sleeping and working in the dorm room, there, but then when we're out doing things, like in the class, hopefully, and uh, doing other things on campus, you won't be able to see that capacity around, at least optimally. And so that's something to consider from a, an optimization perspective. Basically, um, we took a lot of inputs. Uh, we worked for about three or four years to develop a, a solution that we believe is really fit for this environment, and that's why kind of we're introducing you to uh, what we think our coin one miles platform could do. Something I kind of wanted to hop in, as we were talking about the system design, it, it, for all the university campuses that I've attended, um, they're, they're, they're beautiful buildings. I mean, they're, they're many are 100 year old structures. And one, one of the, the, the benefits of these in building wireless systems is you can stealth the antennas fairly easily. The, the in building uh, district antenna systems operate at low power, so the antennas are relatively small. I mean, I was looking around the room to see if I couldn't find one. 
they're, 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 they're virtually indistinguishable, indistinguishable say, that, say that four times, from a smoke alarm. Right. And if you don't like it, we could mount it above the ceiling tile if you really just don't even want to see the thing. Um, for several of our other installations, we've become really creative at installing them behind the signs. I already mentioned about installing them underneath the seats. Um, when, when, you're, when you're driving around town, um, I, I used to live in Colorado, and I-25 is, is the main interstate between Denver and Colorado Springs. When, when you're driving from Denver to Colorado Springs, and you look to your right about Castle Rock, which is about midway, the, the tallest evergreen is, this of course not an evergreen, it's a salt tower. So there's, there's, there's all kinds of ways that we can propagate and get RF within a facility. You've got church steeples, light poles behind signs, um, behind or, or, or above ceilings, and then all that goes into the, the system design. But the reason for pointing that out is because when, when you're looking at this, this large undertaking of deploying the system, you don't want to say, you know, geez, this building was built in the 1800s. And I, I, I just don't want to destroy the aesthetics. Right. I will not allow you to destroy the aesthetics, period, right? So, um, but, but with that in mind, this technology does give you the flexibility of being able to deploy a system to provide a service to your students, faculty, and staff um, with, with, without impairing um, you know, the, the aesthetics of, of your campus. <clears throat> so um, the last, uh, last question is, I mean, my way, and that is, what is the role of systems integrator, and what are the key certifications and other criteria in selecting a qualified systems integrator, and what is the impact on the enterprise's IT staff? <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little about this earlier. Uh, one of the things that I'll say about the role of systems integrator, and by the way, whether it's a uh, uh, third-party funded model or a carrier-funded model, um, us integrators are the ones doing the work. We're either doing it for AT&T or we're doing it for a tower company. So the, the integrator is always a part of the, of the play here. <clears throat> and one of the things that's, that's changed a lot in the last few years uh, is the, uh, the requirements to be a systems integrator are much more stringent today. Uh, the, the bar has been raised, AT&T has certainly raised the bar, uh, and on terms of certifications and training. So you, you've got to know the technology. They heard Mike talk about all the new technology that Corning has. So uh, you're, you're Engineers, RF engineers, project managers need to be trained and certified in the products. If I go back seven, eight years ago, nobody ever asked for a certification. I had installers and RF engineers doing all kinds of work. Uh, the qualifications were rarely ever, ever even asked about. Uh, today, it's very, very important to that an integrator really understand the technology, number one, to go to the point. They really understand the tools, and as Mike or Jim mentioned, the tools. Uh, those tools that are used to do NAS design are very expensive. Uh, they're very expensive software licenses with very expensive maintenance. That company in Canada is doing really well <laughs> with what they're doing. And so it's an investment in the training of people in tools and technology to be an integrator in this space. Now at the same time, we're seeing a whole bunch of more folks enter this space. And they're coming at it saying it's a $15 billion industry, it's just a bunch of cables and antennas, how hard can it be? I can do this. Right? Uh, and, and what we're finding is that, that that's not the case. And, and really, uh, I'll credit AT&T, AT&T of all the carriers is really leading the charge in raising the bar in terms of the technology that goes in. Um, we talk about the advanced 4G technologies being deployed, what have you, uh, which drives to the technology gets deployed, but also to the qualifications of the folks actually doing the work, to the point where we now have to provide those certifications uh, that this person is on site on this day with this level of training and this level of certification. So the investment on the part of the integrator uh, is very, very important. So as, <clears throat> as you are looking at potentially working with integrators, um, that's a good two or three pages of uh, questions and answers in your RFP about who you're dealing with, what those certifications are, what investment is that integrator making into the space. Uh, and we think that's, that's very, very important. Again, we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, our company, Black Boss, is investing in our wireless solutions practice to go build these networks and build the way they need to be. Uh, the complexity uh, has just gone through the roof in the last uh, five years. Uh, really driven by all the 4G technology, and I'm sure maybe some of the other sessions 
you know, you see the famous chart, right, that goes from now out to 2016, 2018 of the growth, and it's all about data, it's all about video, and it's all going across these networks, right? And so that, that growth in just the packets is, is tremendous. That changes the game for everybody in the game, certainly for us as an integrator as well. So uh, I think those, uh, those issues are very, very important to be looked at uh, today, and they were perhaps less important uh, a few years back. So we're very strong now. Um, the final question, uh, Jim, we'll let you close it out, and uh, just one piece, and that is, uh, you know, what is carrier coordination and how do you go about that? And we'll throw it in the Q&A from there. Well, uh, carrier coordination, I mean, we're, we, we, we need to ensure that we know what devices are installed utilizing our spectrum, and, and regardless of the business model, whether it's, you know, the venue or university-owned, third-party, neutral host owned or, or carrier owned, and we, we need to know it's operating in our spectrum. And so therefore, um, there, there is a process, and, and, and the process of coordinating with the carriers is usually done by the owner of the, of the system, so that you know, the, the, the third party um, integrator would, would take, well, the third party neutral host would take responsibility for that. Uh, they may turn that over to the integrator um, but if you decide to deploy your own system, you've taken ownership and responsibility for integrating and interfacing with the wireless operators. And the problem with that, the wireless operator can sit back and go, well, I want to look at your design. And I, I, I need to ensure that this system will not only impair our network, but will perform as expected. And we may sit back and go, well, we don't want to join the system, unless you make a few changes and tweaks to the system. Because you know, at the end of the day, if it doesn't work, who are they going to call? They're going to be calling us, not, not anybody else, right? And, and to the point about the, the tremendous growth in mobile data traffic since the beginning of, since January of 2007, um, we have seen a 50,000% growth in mobile data traffic. So when, when you graph a 50,000% growth, I wish my 401k uh, has performed as well. <laughs> we, we, we'd all have this uh, via teleconference, I mean, Bali Bali with stupid here on the night. So, um, yeah, wish, wish we all had that problem, right? But it's, but, it's, but it's why we're deploying so much infrastructure within these venues. It's why we're deploying um, with, with, with advanced systems to ensure that the, the people who are installing your training. Um, uh, Paula Devlin, who's, who's in charge of our construction and engineering group, uh, she had shared uh, with us pictures of kind of like a before and after. They had equipment stacked on top of cardboard boxes, the cables kind of screwing all over the place, you know, and, and, and of course the after, everything's in, in racks and way mold and the, and the cables just, just, just spray. So, because when you look at these investments, they're, they're long-term investments. And, um, you know, because they are expensive, they are long-term investments, and, and with the data system largely, once it's built, um, you could add additional technology and services at the head end um, without having to disrupt the wired infrastructure that's built throughout the campus. So are there any questions from the, uh, from the audience? We'll go ahead and answer. Yes, sir. Um, do you recommend Hi-Fi um, as the initial procurement process instead of going to RFI? What was the person who recommended? RFI or oh, RFI? Um, I'll take that one and then I'll pass over to those. Um, yeah, I do. Uh, I mean, I think <clears throat> the RFI process is an excellent way to find out who you want to play with. Right? You know, who's out there that, and what their qualifications are and maybe a short list of folks that uh, understand the various business models and what, and what have you. So I think, yeah, a, a two-step process, if you will, um, is a good thing to do. Um, you know, one thing that, um, as an integrator, you know, we have limited resources, and we look at a lot of RFPs, and when an RFP is you know, sort of kind of all over the map, and we look at it and we say, there's, there's no deal to be done here, and we don't want to invest the, the resources to go do it. We all have limited resources. So the RFI process is a good way to get an information exchange going back and forth. So uh, I'm very, uh, very strongly in favor of that. Okay. Else comment? Next question. Your bachelor, we will make one up and call it. <laughs> 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 
options they're giving. Right, that's right. Yes, sir. So, probably a kind of a simple question, but uh, I think that uh, another section from the last year about that, uh, one of the things that they were showing about kind of the infrastructure of all the services that they had set up to uh, see and we were looking at, you know, 20 racks full of gear from cables going up and down and everything. It's massive facility and it's going to be asking about the common space that we need to have and so all that kind of infrastructure that we're seeing on the past. I was wondering if you could comment on that. And so the, the question is really goes to uh, if you're deploying it as a campus and how much space, power, racks, and things along those lines. Uh, I'll answer the first part of that. Um, uh, a, a stadium and arena is very different than other buildings. Right? Uh, so uh, when we do uh, call it traditional buildings, non stadium arenas, um, we're taking relatively small amounts of space. The actual uh, single source equipment from the carriers is much more compact now than it used to be. So on uh, the actual head-in uh, equipment uh, is rack mountable, it's very compact. The remote units in the IDFs are very small, some can be hung on the wall, some can be hung on a rack, etc. A lot of flexibility in how you how you do that. When you get into the stadiums and arenas, uh, now you're starting to talk about a lot of equipment. The actual DAS equipment isn't the bulk of the equipment, it's actually most of that's the single source equipment because of that extreme amount of capacity that has to be driven in there, uh, in that, that space. The good news, though, to the point that Mike made earlier, is that uh, if you're doing a arena uh, or stadium and then other parts of the campus, that becomes your carrier hotel. So you gobble up the space that you need there, but then you take virtually no space or very little space in other parts of the campus as you're distributing across that fiber. So you can start to get some trade off there as well. Well, I have a few things to say. Um, you know, when, when the lights went out at the Super Bowl game uh, two years ago, I'm happy to report our our district and tennis system did not did not go down. Um, we, we we had a dedicated utility feed from from the utility company. We had a dedicated uh, battery backup system. We also had a, a diesel generator. And our technicians, because it's of course it was such a high profile battery, we, we had the technicians on site who well they didn't have to, but they powered up a diesel generator just in case because nobody knew that, nobody knew what that was going on. But, but at least if something did go wrong, we want to make sure the gas system uh, remained in operation. So, so in addition to all the things that we're talking about that take up space, we have to worry about things like <coughs> power backup. Um, also, uh, like like Hurricane Katrina, that the lesson learned there, these large public venues aren't there just to support the events for the public venue. And, and, and oftentimes, in, in the event of a, of a disaster, those events are then recommissioned, if you will, and then used uh, for, for housing, if you will. Um, the, the actual size, it's, it's really, really, really hard to answer the question, you know, how much room do you need? Because it's based on, you know, how much capacity is required. And then each, each operator, you know, we'll, we'll look at it and go, oh my god, we've got this 50,000 percent growth. We, we, we try to design and plan systems around a three-year that is, we don't want to mess with it for three years. Sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. Um, but, but we're trying to get ahead of that curve, right? That's our curve. And then you have the other wireless carriers, and they're, they're looking at their, their customer base, market um, potential, and, and the like. Now, now, the advantage that universities have over, say, other venues is, is you're, you're dealing with a population that everyone has a cell phone, they're all using using traffic and as and the wireless operator wants to keep those customers as they become adults but but um, as I transgress if you have any new buildings that that are about to be constructed let's let's think about wireless when you're when you're building the construction when you know the, like like I said the most expensive not most expensive but one of the, the, the costs the high costs of deploying does was actually pulling the fiber. So, so when you're building a, a building, um, allow for fiber, fiber conduits you know, between between floors, between buildings. Um, the, the the head end where all this equipment needs to be stored will obviously have to have power. Yeah. But it also has to be air conditioned because all this equipment, unfortunately, does use up and 
consume and generate a lot of heat. Um, the the IDF, IDF clauses where the remote units are typically installed, they too, of course, need power. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of things, and that's really where you know the, the, the integrators come in to play and say, hey, look, before you start you know, laying the foundation, let's let's take into account wireless because you know, when you look at wireless, it's almost like the fourth utility, right? So, people nowadays expect it. Um, and unfortunately, when there's an emergency on campus, you need it. Um, so we, we kind of take it into account when, when you're actually building these buildings as well. I, I thought a little bit more about space. Uh, I think a little bit more specifically. In fact, I, I talked about this one platform a little bit earlier. Um, we designed it intentionally with space in mind. In fact, at the head end, our head end takes half the space of any competitive solution out here right now. When you get to the closet, if you do an integrated infrastructure, you can take a 40U rack space and an IDF and take it down to one or two U. Okay, that's the magnitude of the change that you see when you integrate these different platforms. Because frankly, a lot of these closets are full of Cat5 and 6 cables. And the other reality that hasn't been talked about is historically, DAS solutions only live for three or four years. There's the newest uh, wireless technology out, and people either rip and replace all the infrastructure or they'll overbuild on top of that and you end up with clogging and clogging and clogging. And the point we like to make is if you do it on an all the infrastructure, just like that can live for the life of the building. You don't replace the plumbing in your building every three or four years. We don't think you should be replacing the networks in the physical infrastructure, the physical way of the infrastructure in your buildings every three or four years. So I would suggest that you can uh, have a lot less space, a lot less heat generation, because we have, a, in the IDF specifically, uh, most DAS solutions use a lot of power and generate a lot of heat even in the closets, and our solution generates uh, virtually very little, almost no heat in the closet. At least as a power supply, that's it. Um, so, um, if space is a consideration, then, I mean, all vendors, I'm sure, are trying to get better, but, but our solution is significantly less uh, space. Mike, uh, we have time for maybe one more question, and we'll just make a couple of closing comments and move on. Any other questions? Do you have any last comments? Yeah. Mike? We thank you.